Okay, so I introduced you to chromatin, which was a certain structure for the chromosome. Most of you are familiar with the structure of the chromosome that is known as chromatids. And here is a picture of chromatids. Um, if I asked you to draw me a structure of a chromosome, you probably would have drawn something similar to what we got going on over here, most likely. This is really only going to be observed in a cell undergoing cellular division and mitosis. Now, really what's happening here is we're taking that chromatin network and we're condensing the molecule down even more. We're getting rid of channels and things like that and condensing it down even more by adding additional coils. I know, they just like want to disappear. Additional coils. This becomes ver visible uh, under just a simple light microscope during the phase of mitosis known as metaphase when they fully condense and they line up in the middle of the cell on what we refer to as the metaphase plate. Now, this is an individual chromatid. When we get ready for the pairs of chromosomes to divide into their new cells, they line up with a duplicated pair. And we attach those two things together so you can kind of see that here we have these two structures, which is analogous to this. They come together and they're paired up. And when they do, or when they undergo this pairing process, when the pairs form, this is referred to now not as a chromatid, but as a sister or sister chromatids. Sister chromatids. Now this part right here in the kind of middle where it kind of looks like it's squeezed together, sort of looks like it's wearing a belt, that's actually going to be a proteinaceous plaque that's known as the centromere. So the centromere is going to be this proteinaceous region that holds the chromatid, the sister chromatids together. Now, within that proteinaceous structure, we have a region of the centromere that is known as the kinetochore. And the kinetochore is actually going to consist of motor proteins that will help to move these sister chromatid in opposite directions as new cells begin to form. So motor protein, these were those guys who were carrying around those vesicles in that movie that everybody seems to like so much. We have the same proteins present in the kinetochore that is going to walk these sister chromatid in opposite directions towards the new forming uh, poles for, for the new cells that are being formed. They do this because they actually bind to and interact with microtubules which are part of the cytoskeleton. These microtubules, part of the cytoskeleton, make up what's known as the mitotic spindles. Oh my gosh. It is the ends. No, get out of there. Not yet. Spin. No. No, 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 Yeah, so the, the motor proteins in the kinetochore, these are going to bind to and interact with microtubules, which are part of the cytoskeleton, and form the mitotic spindle. So as we're dividing a cell, we have metaphase plate that forms, and then we have these spindles that run down.
from each side of. I had a good beat going there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what time is it? Oh, man. All right, so we form the, the, the metaphase plate, and then we have the mitotic spindles. And so there's going to be that protonaceous plaque that's actually going to interact with that mitotic spindle. And we're going we're gonna to separate those in both directions. One, one side of the chromatin is going that way, one side is going that way. And it's going to be these motor proteins that basically put on our big old chromatin backpack and start hustling their way down to the other part of the cell. I'm so far behind right now. Okay. If anyone sees any end, let me know. Oh my gosh, here we go. <laughs> okay, we have a similar molecule in RNA. And the, the only real difference here is we now add an oxygen on the ribose sugar, so it's no longer a deoxygenated ribose, deoxyribose nucleic acid, and we end up with ribonucleic acid. RNA has got a very unique structure, and you can sort of see it highlighted here. Instead of being the double helix with two different strands, we actually have a single strand. Now, this single strand isn't necessarily just a linear piece of RNA. It actually is going to fold back and kind of fold back on itself. And that's what you see going on here is you kind of get this sort of hairpin-like structure because it's folded back on itself to form additional structure. So we have this internal folding pattern that forms. The nucleotides are just a little bit different in the RNA molecule. Uh, in fact, they consist of adenine, guanine, and cytosine, which we've seen with the DNA. But rather than having thymine, they have uracil will abbreviate as U. So adenine, guanine, cytosine plus uracil. So if I ever give you a sequence and I say the sequence is A, G, C, U instead of T, you know that it's RNA and not DNA because the uracil is present. So does the U match up with the A? It does. Yep. So your base pairing here is going to be U to the A and the G to the C. In fact, uracil looks very similar to thiamine. It's just chemically just a little bit different. These molecules, molecules of RNA, are going to be nucle nucleus born. They're going to be produced in the nucleus, but they are going to act in the cytosol. So that means that we need to have some sort of transport mechanism to get them from the solution in the nucleus out to the solution in the rest of the cell, in the cytosol. And they're actually going to be transferred through the nucleus by nuclear pores. And in that video I showed you just a few minutes ago, you actually saw the RNA molecules being spit out of the nucleus. We have nucleus pores, so the nucleus is, forms an envelope that looks something like this. These would be the parts of the nucleus all the way around. Looks something like that where you have your phospholipid bilayer that sort of wraps around itself. So this is the inside of the nucleus, and our messenger RNA molecules are going to slip right out of the nuclear pore being transported into the cytosol. There are going to be three primary types. Three primary types of RNA. And they are all involved in helping the DNA molecule which holds information to become proteins 
which confer physiological function. Okay? The DNA in itself doesn't really do anything physiologically. It just is an information storage molecule. We've got to get it to protein, and it's going to go from DNA to protein by way of RNA molecules. So here are ribbon diagrams of your three different types of RNAs that we're going to find inside of the cell. The first one here is the mRNA, which is actually going to be referred to as messenger RNA. And these are going to be RNA molecules that are up to 10,000 bases in length that are going to hold the information to generate proteins. This is basically the molecule that we use to go from DNA to protein. It is going to be the intermediary between DNA and protein. The next type of molecule here is going to be our tRNA. It's named T. Not only does it kind of look like a T, but it's referred to as tRNA because it's the transfer RNA. tRNA is going to be associated with specific, a specific amino acid. And it's going to transfer the information contained in the messenger RNA to a growing protein molecule as we go through the process of protein synthesis. So tRNA is the transfer RNA, and it is involved in assembling amino acid chains that eventually will become proteins. Now our last molecule of RNA here is the rRNA, and the R stands for ribosomal RNA, and this particular RNA is going to be a component of, well, hopefully you've already guessed, the ribosome. So this is a component of the ribosome, and the ribosome is actually going to be the organelle of protein synthesis. This is where the information that's found in the messenger RNA molecule is going to be transferred or translated to an amino acid sequence of protein. All right, so now let's talk about using DNA and RNA. Let's talk about using those two molecules to do something useful. Biologists model this whole process in what's known as the central dogma of molecular biology. The central dogma of molecular biology is just a statement on information flow inside of the cell. Basically, we start out with the DNA. It gets transcribed into the sister language of RNA, which gets translated into a completely different language of amino acids to generate a protein. And then it's the protein that will create the outward expression, the, basically the physiology, if you will. The term a gene is just simply a length of DNA that is going to code for the information to produce RNAs. Now, in all reality, what we refer to as a gene, just simply a length of DNA that's going to give rise to RNA, a single gene, it's not rare for that one length of DNA to contain multiple loads. Multiple genes that produce RNAs. So that would be one gene containing many genes, or you would have a long gene that contains a series of shorter genes or smaller genes. And they all give rise to different proteins. Now, in addition to that, we also have RNAs that can be produced 
that can pr provide or produce multiple proteins. This is known as alternative splicing. So alternative splicing. So this is just simply this idea that we can have individual messenger RNAs that all are the same. You can see I have one, two, three, four, five of the same messenger RNA sequences. And the coding part of the genes can be organized in a variety of different ways to give me several different proteins. So we've already mentioned that the human genome has been sequenced. We know it's 3.5 billion individual nucleotides. And we've estimated anywhere from 20,000 to 30,000 individual genes. But because of things like alternative splicing, those 20,000 to 30,000 genes become between 200,000 and 300,000 proteins. And all of these proteins become very, very specific and do very, very specific things. So they're not just an ion channel. These proteins can be specifically a sodium ion channel. They only move sodium. That's my performance, my lecture in once and drugs. Excuse me, you really get me here. It's probably not. So how do we actually <laughs> how do we actually take I did that for a laugh. Just to see if everyone was still paying attention. So how do we go from DNA through RNA to produce a protein? It's referred to as the genetic code, or these are the rules that we use to generate all of the proteins. The thing that's really interesting about this is this is a very simple code or simple language. It only consists of four letters. If we're talking about the DNA, it's AGCT. If we're talking about the RNA, it's AGCU. But from this very simple code, we can end up with very complex information. Potentially millions of proteins. Now, there's probably really not millions of proteins in a single organism's genome, but there is the capability to produce millions of proteins proteins in that single organism's genome. So how can we actually get that sort of complex? Think about the human language. Let's talk about the English alphabet. Really, you have 26 characters and you have a space. So you have 27 different <coughs> characters and spaces that can be utilized to produce words. And there's about 10,000 words that most of you know, which is a lot, but really in the context of everything isn't all that much. So humans, even in our complex language, are generating tens of thousands of words. From this simple code, with our four letters, if we organize them simply into three letter repeats, I end up with 40, I'm sorry, 64 different possible three letter repeats. So there are going to be 64 possible repeats, and mathematically, the way we calculate that is take the number of letters to the number of spaces that we have. So 64. So I'm basically saying you could have three A's in a row. That would be one possibility. A A T. There's a second possibility. A A G. There's a third possibility. There's going to be 64 of those. Okay. So this language really has 64 words. Still pretty simple, but what ends up happening is we can organize these 64 words in almost an infinitesimal 
number of ways. We can build sentences, if sentences are analogous to the gene, in many, many different ways. And we end up with meaningful genetic information from those words that we produce. These individual three-letter repeats are known as base triplets. And it's going to be our messenger RNA molecule. Our messenger RNA molecule. that carries the base triplet information. Basically, the messenger RNA is going to say, here are your words, this is how they are organized to generate your proteins. We also refer to these as codons. Okay, so what does the genetic code actually look like? We organize it in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it's a circle, sometimes it's a square. The same, or the way you use it is, is always basically going to be about the same. You determine your three-letter repeat, and it tells you exactly which amino acid or stop sequence actually is going to be used. So let's say I wanted to know um, ATG. I start out with A, I go to T, and I go to G, and this codes for the amino acid so in the genetic code, I have 61 base triplets that code for amino acids. I'm just going to abbreviate that as AA. So 61 of these, if you're counting them up, 61 are going to code for amino acids. Now, there are only 20 amino acids. That means there's going to be some repeats. So if you look over here, I can go GTG, GTA, GTC, GTT, and I always get valent. I told you it was 64, so what's the deal here with the 61? Well, three of the triplets of the remaining three, these are going to be codes for stop codons. And these are going to be, in the RNA language, UAG, UGA, go Bulldogs, or UAA, University of Alaska Anchorage, go Sea Wolves. Yeah, there's stop codons. That would be where the, that's a period. That's the end of the sentence. AUG, which I gave you in the DNA, ATG. So AUG is going to code for methionine, but this is also our start codon. So every single protein that is produced begins with a methionine until it goes through some sort of modification. Yep, all the time. But it doesn't necessarily stick. So it's not like you can be like, okay, so insulin, the first is methionine. It actually gets, most frequently, it gets chopped off or trimmed off. <laughs> but when we're building our protein, that nascent, that very first new protein as it emerges from the ribosome, it's going to be a methionine. All right, so now that we sort of have all of this background information, what I want to do now is talk to you about taking that information and turning it into a protein. So here is a picture of protein synthesis inside of the context of the cell. So you can see the nucleus, nuclear pores, we're producing our RNA here, we're dumping it out here to generate our protein. Now, I don't, I'm not going to really expect you to know this whole process. This is a molecular biology, cell biology type, um, type knowledge. I just want you to be familiar with what's going on here. 
So I'm going to set the stage, and then I'm just going to talk to you. I'm not even going to write anything down. I just want you to listen. So to set the stage, what you need to know is that in cells, every single cell you have in your body has all of the genes. So your muscle cells, they have muscle-specific genes. They also have the genes that are required for digesting protein. So why don't we destroy our muscle? Well, it's because... Even though all of the genes are present, only specific genes are turned on. So those digestive enzymes that are coded in the genome that we find inside of a muscle cell, they're going to be present in the muscle cell in the DNA, but not produced as RNA, because they're not turned on. They're only going to be produced in cells that make up the intestine, where we need to have digestion occur. So, whenever I need a specific protein, it's probably coming from a specific cell. The, uh, beta cells of the pancreas are really good at producing insulin, but they don't really produce brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The process here of protein synthesis is going to be broken up into a couple different steps. The first step is going to be transcription. Okay, so step one is transcription. Transcription occurs in the nucleus, uh, and it's going to be catalyzed by a enzyme known as RNA polymerase. This is basically the enzyme that allows information held in the DNA to be transcribed into RNA. By the way, why are we calling it transcription? Because we are going from one language to a similar language. Transcription is something that we, we, we would take. You're transcribing my notes right now. I'm giving you my notes in English, and you are putting them down on your paper in English. You would be translating my notes if I was writing down here in German, and you were writing the notes down in Swahili. So transcription, because we're going from the language, DNA nucleotide language to the RNA nucleotide language. Now, the initial RNA that is produced is a molecule known as a pre-RNA. And this consists of both exons, which code for proteins, and then introns that are inserted between the uh, exons, and they don't really code for information. We have to actually pull those out of the pre-messenger RNA molecule to form our mature molecule of messenger RNA. So once that pre-messenger RNA molecule is produced by RNA polymerase from the DNA, it's actually going to be processed. So step number two, we have to prepare the mature messenger RNA molecule. It's going to be enzymes that remove the introns and put the exons back together. We're going to have alternative splicing that occurs here where some exons are put in different uh, sequence compared to exons in other messenger RNA molecules. And then we're going to take and cap both ends of the messenger RNA molecule. We're going to put on this guanine cap, and we're going to put on this thing called the poly A tail. This stabilizes the molecule, protects it from degradation, and then we're going to transport it from the nucleoplasm out here into the cytosol through our nuclear core. And so now we're going to have a finished, mature messenger RNA molecule that's out here in the cytosol. Once we get into the cytosol, Step number three is going to be to take that information in the nucleotide language and convert it into the language of amino acids through translation. Translation occurs on the ribosomes. The ribosomes attach to the messenger RNA. We actually have a large subunit and a small subunit of the messenger RNA. And it comes in and it caps off and kind of surrounds the messenger RNA molecule. And then it moves along the messenger RNA molecule. And as it moves along the messenger RNA molecule, it's lining up each of those triplets in just the right 
way so that a transfer RNA holding a specific amino acid can come in and bind and extend the growing protein molecule. So we get this growing protein molecule that is generated. Now, I'm going to talk specifically about the three steps of translation that are going to be required. Those three steps are going to be initiation, elongation, and termination. So initiation, elongation, and termination. So what happens here with initiation is that small subunit of the ribosome actually binds first. Then a tRNA containing amino acid. What amino acid do you think it's going to be? Methionine. So the amino acid uh, methionine is going to be added in. And inside of the ribosome, so we would have our messenger RNA molecule, we have our small unit, and then we have our large unit. We have three locations inside of the large subunit. They're known as the APE. EPA if you read it that way, APE if you read it backwards. And these sites are basically the locations where the triplet's going to line up, and that allows the tRNA molecule to come in, protect it, and bind to and read the messenger RNA code. So as the ribosome sets up, the methionine, can, the, the transfer RNA containing the methionine is going to line up on the A site. That's called the activation site. The ribosome shifts along the messenger RNA so that the first tRNA shifts over to the P, which is the protein synthesis location. The amino acid on the tRNA is actually going to disassociate chemically from the tRNA and get transferred to the ribosome. So the ribosome is now going to be holding that amino acid. And then it shifts over a little bit further, and now we're at the E site, and that's the exit site. The tRNA gets dumped back out of the ribosome. The whole time that this is happening, we would have methionine that comes in, and then it shifts over here, and we'd have a second amino or transfer RNA that comes in immediately here. It shifts over, now we have our third uh, our third at the A site, our second at the P site, first at the E site to go away. And we have this growing amino acid chain that begins to be spit out of the ribosome. Once the tRNA is empty, it actually goes back and it gets uh, it, what's called the amino acid pool. This is just a bunch of individual amino acids that are stored individually within each cell. And they go back and chemically are recharged to hold the right, correct, specific amino acid. So elongation is this whole process of bringing in the right tRNA, transferring the amino acid onto the growing protein chain, and then exiting it out. This happens over and over and over again until we reach a termination site. We reach a stop codon. So um, one of those stop codons like UAA, UGA, or uh, UAG. Now, the termination, once we reach that stop codon, we're actually not going to put in another transfer RNA. We're actually going to put on a releasing factor. So a releasing factor, which is a type of protein, binds up on that A site. And now we have no additional amino acids that can be put on in the growing peptide chain. And so when the ribosome shifts over, rather than transfer an amino acid, the amino acid that was last transferred releases from the ribosome, and that new protein is kicked out into the cytoplasm. Once we've reached the end of the line, small unit, large unit are going to dissociate. They may revert, go back to the beginning and do it all over again and go through that whole process. Okay, so there's uh, about 12 weeks of material from molecular biology crammed into 13 and a half minutes. All right. There are a few things that we uh, should know about. I don't know why I just put that there. Let's put it right here. 
certain types of proteins are going to need to be secreted really well. I'm just going to simply call those secretory proteins. A lot of times these are going to be protein hormones that need to be dumped out into the bloodstream to go and have some effect someplace else. The secretory proteins, rather than the ribosome, be, ribosome just being one of these free ribosomes that's floating around in the cytoplasm, these secretory proteins <clears throat> are frequently going to be assembled on the rough endoplasmic reticulum or the rough ER. So as you can see here, here's our endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosome will spit the forming protein into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now what you need to think about the rough endoplasmic reticulum is it's a modification center. It's a place where we take a product and we reorganize it into a new product. And then we distribute it to the Golgi complex, which you need to think about as being the packaging and delivery center inside of the cell. It's the UPS of the cell. We're going to package everything up and we're going to deliver it where we need to deliver it. So for the secretory pro proteins, they're assembled on the rough ER and the protein itself is spit into the ER and into that inner space which we refer to uh, as the cistern or the cisterne of the endoplasmic reticulum. Another variation on the theme that produces really high throughput of protein synthesis is known as the polyribosome. And the polyribosome is just simply going to be multiple ribosomes all on one messenger RNA molecule. And so they all start down at one end and they move along and as they move along they're producing proteins. And so rather than just having one ribosome that works a messenger RNA transcript, we may have hundreds that are on a messenger RNA transcript. And in the same unit of time, we can produce 100,000 proteins instead of just one protein. So those are just a couple examples of variation on the theme of protein synthesis. Once we've generated a new protein molecule, many of our proteins are going to be processed and prepared frequently for things like secretion. So we have protein processing and secretion. What types of things need to happen for protein processing? Well, one of the things that needs to happen is we need to get that new protein into its correct three-dimensional shape or structure or orientation so that it can have its effective function. If it's an enzyme, we want to get it into its three-dimensional structure where the enzyme is actually going to be able to catalyze its reaction. <laughs> Sometimes in order to get it into a three-dimensional shape, we need a structure that looks something like this. This is actually called a chaperone. Now you've all probably gone on field trips before at some time in your life and you had an adult who came along with you that you called your chaperone. And the chaperone was there to make sure that you didn't do anything stupid. In the case of protein synth synthesis, the chaperone is going to be an older protein that's existed for a while that is going to help the newly produced protein, the young protein, not do anything stupid and fold up into the correct three-dimensional conformation. Now, not every protein is going to require a chaperone, but many of them do require a chaperone. And they need to be able to be protected from uh, hydropho or from uh, uh, aqueous solutions because they need to generate hydrophobic interactions that otherwise aren't possible. Things like that. So everybody got all of this? I know I'm flying right now, um, and that's just because this stuff is really, um, if we get a 300,000 foot view of all of this, that's, that's going to be adequate. <laughs> okay, so after we've had translation of an RNA molecule into a protein, we can actually undergo modifications. We refer to this as post- translational modifications. 
So we generate a new protein, and that protein may have to have some additional stuff that's done to it. A lot of this is going to be done in the endoplasma reticulum and in the Golgi complex. Uh, just some examples of some things that we might need to do to a protein to get it into its active final form. We may need to remove some amino acids. So we may clip off that methionine or the first 25 amino acids, including the methionine of a protein. Um, we might create some bonds, especially disulfide bonds, to help uh, stabilize the protein in its final three-dimensional structure. So create some disulfide bonds to stabilize. Or we might add things like carbohydrates or other prosthetic groups. And as we do each of these things, it's going to slightly change the function of the protein. So we make some of those modifications, and the next thing that we really need to do, or could need to do, <laughs> we're going to need to be able to transport, and so we're going to push these modified proteins that are ready to go out and cause some sort of physiology to occur, we'll put them into transport vesicles. And we can move them to places like the Golgi complex, or we might move them to the cell membrane to distribute out into the extracellular fluid to be picked up by the bloodstream. If we go to the Golgi complex, as we go through the Golgi complex, there may be some additional modifications that occur. And then out the other side. So that's what you see in here in this figure. We release the protein in a vesicle from the endoplasmic reticulum, and we make our way through the Golgi complex, modifying at each of these different levels of the Golgi complex, and then release out of the face of the Golgi complex and, and push it out towards uh, the membrane, and then through, what would this process be? Bulk transport, so it's going to be uh, exocytosis. <laughs> the GG. So vesicles uh, from the Golgi complex go out to the membrane and then are released by exocytosis. Okay, so that again is in a nutshell, a really, really small nutshell. The basics of taking DNA, converting it into proteins that are going to have physiological function. Many of these physiological functions that we're going to soon be talking about as we go through individual organ systems. I want to talk about two more things regarding genes and gene uh, expression, and then I want to talk a little bit about DNA replication and the cell cycle to sort of finish all of this out. So let's deal with gene expression tonight. This will be the last thing that we talk about that will be on the exam for next week. So gene expression. This is the idea that genes are not continuously being produced. And the reason that is is because 
producing proteins is a very energetically demanding process. So we don't want to constantly produce proteins even when they're not needed. We want to do it on demand. We want to produce proteins when we absolutely need that protein. So instead of producing them constantly, our genes can be turned on or turned off. So usually to turn the protein on or off, something's going to have to happen. And I'm just going to simply refer to this or say that this is an event has to occur. When that event occurs, maybe it's ingestion of glucose. Maybe it's an increase in blood pressure. Maybe it's the use of illicit drugs. I don't know. If some sort of event occurs, and that event uh, causes or um, produces factors that are activated. So we get factors that are activated. And these factors are really going to be proteins. So we're going to get this upregulation of these proteins. And they are going to have regulatory or transcription inducing capabilities. And so we're going to refer to them as regulatory factors or transcription factors. Again, these are just simply certain types of proteins. Now, these regulatory or transcription factors, when they are activated by our event, they usually bind to the DNA. And they're going to bind in such a way that that DNA can be activated to interact with a molecule called RNA polymerase. Now it's ASE, so we know that it's an enzyme. And it's a polymerase, so we know that it's actually going to build a chain of, of molecules together. In this case, it's RNA. So we're going to generate an RNA molecule from our DNA with RNA polymerase. So this RNA polymerase is going to be attracted to attach a docking site. Once that RNA polymerase is in place, you already know everything that goes on. We've already discussed that. To a docking site. <clears throat> so it attaches a docking site or a location on the DNA where we're going to begin to take the information in that gene and convert it into a messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA is going to be made. And this will result in eventually a protein being produced. Now, in all reality, not all of our factors are going to be activating. Some of them are actually going to be inhibitory as well. And these inhibitory factors, rather than allowing RNA polymerase to attach and bind to the DNA to begin to produce RNAs, they're going to turn off RNA polymerase or prevent RNA polymerase from having its polymerizing effect.